the site selection business meeting of the World Science Fiction Society at the 75th World Science Fiction Convention will be in order. I'm the chairman, Kevin Stanley. To my left is our timekeeper, Paul Dormer. He will keep track of debate time and discussion time limits. To my right is Linda Dinneroff, the secretary, uh, the hardest working person on, in the business meeting. <laughs> to her right is Donald Eastlake, the deputy, also uh, running the slides. And he will preside in those cases where I am uh, recusing myself. There will be one of those at the end of today's uh, meeting, I believe, later. And uh, behind the camera is the official videographer, Lisa Hayes, with her assistant, Kuma Bear. And then we'll go to the next slide. This meeting is being recorded. If you are sitting forward of the pillars, your voice and image will probably be recorded. These recordings will appear on YouTube. It is being probably, if the tech worked, live streamed on the Worldcon 75 uh, Worldcon 75 YouTube channel. Thank you. Uh, it is also being officially recorded over here. Those recordings will eventually appear on the. Uh, Worldcon Events YouTube channel. They are independent of each other. The tech team running the live streaming is not doing these official recordings. The official recording team does not know anything about the, the live streaming. So don't ask one about the other. <coughs> if you do not want your voice and image recorded, you need to sit back behind the pillars and you will not be able to speak in debate, although if there are things that are being voted on, you'll be able to vote. We will have short, what we call technical timeouts, approximately every 20 to 30 minutes uh, in order to change the recording cartridge in the camera. These, car these timeouts will be less than one minute long. So I really, really ask you, don't go getting up and wandering around unless you, know, uh, uh, unless you can immediately sit back down. Remember to pick up at a business meeting, attendee a ribbon if there's any left, uh, and to sign up on the sign-on sheets that you were here, <coughs> to silence your sound-making devices. Here, I'll do mine, so that I'm a good person here. There, there. When you are called upon to speak, you need to come to a microphone. There are only two microphones. There is one on this lectern. That one is a fairly sensitive one that you do not have to lean into. The one that I am talking into, this handheld mic, which we will bring to people who have difficulty standing, or, uh, or, or if you really must, come over here and stand about where I am in front of me. This one you need to talk into the way I'm doing, fairly close. Please remember which microphone you're using. Please remember to be civil in debate and address all your comments by way of the chair. I'm not going to go into the stuff about appeals here. So let's go on to the agenda for today. This first portion of the meeting is the uh, announcement of site selection results and initial presentation from the 2019 Worldcon. Followed by that time, uh, and they have up to 15 minutes to deal with that. Uh, followed by that will be up to 15 minutes for questions and presentations from Worldcon 76. Just because we're allowed that much time doesn't mean we have to use it. 2020 bidders are allowed at five minutes. There is going to be no more time for any other presentations other than that. At the end of that, we will go into recess until at least 11 o'clock. We may be in recess longer than that, but until at least 11 o'clock. At which point, I'm going to need the help of people to rearrange the first two rows of chairs here in order to do the for former Worldcon chair, former past, present, and future Worldcon chair's photo session, which will take place on this stage. And our plan for that is for us to put a row, we're going to put more chairs up here on the stage, we'll have a row of people standing behind those, and if necessary, a row of chairs sitting in front of us. At no earlier than 11 o'clock, we will return to order for to pick up 
on the substantive agenda where we left off, and I believe that series is the first thing up at that point. And therefore, we are now at site selection results. The chair, where are the site selection, where's the site selection team? Yes, uh, the, the chair recognizes the site selection television. Try that again, sir. The chair recognizes the site selection team to bring us the results. If you could go over to the lectern. Thank you. <clears throat> so, Science Selection 2017 for Worldcon 2019. The total number of valid votes was 1,227. Of those, 1,196 were cast with a preference. Dublin in 2019 received 1,160 votes. None of the above, five. No preference, 31, and various writing options, 31. So the winner is clearly Dublin in 2019. I am Johan Anglemark, I am, was area head, area head of site selection at Welcome 75. The full list of results will, be, will appear in the minutes. The minutes of this meeting will eventually appear at WISPIS.org. Is there any objection to thanking the site selection tellers? Hearing none, congratulations <laughs> to the tellers. these ballots to be destroyed. I have to give you instructions to do that. Is there any <laughs> objection? Not yet. Not yet. I'm okay. Not yet. Is there any objection to ordering the site selection ballots, ordering the tellers to destroy the site selection ballots? No. Here? Okay. Uh, I guess I forgot to warn people because you have some new... The, when the chair asks, is there any objection, the way you tell, tell us that you have no objection is to say nothing. <laughs> Hearing no objection, the chair instructs the site selection ballots be destroyed. The results are now official. Congratulations, Dublin. The chair would now like to call on the Dublin committee to give their initial presentation, not to add, not to exceed 15 minutes. Who's here? There we go. Five minutes. Yeah, that's right. It's five minutes and then ten minutes of questions. But in any way, fifteen minutes total, we can manage. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very much. My name is James Bacon, and I will be the chair for the Worldcon to be held in Dublin, Ireland, in 2019. <laughs> This is a really, really lovely moment. Given all the hard work so many people have put in over the last number of years, many of you here have helped us, supported us, and this is a very special occasion to be able to say we are bringing a World Science Fiction Convention to Ireland for the first time. Many of our team cannot be here, and I am sorry for that. With all this hard effort, determination, a sense of humor, and good spirit has gotten us here. And I hope all of you here will join us in Ireland. Our name is a very important element, as you all might know. And so we spent a lot of time on this. Uh, we had dozens upon dozens of suggestions. And some of us had to turn to various elements to get the juices and the creative sense of it. Our name will be... Very well, so you can all uh, say it straight away with me. It's a Balia Ahakia da Vila Agisni Dei, 
a cold oil finish gelicht olive on down on a shock do shock do a just down con erna We will be getting extra special large badges. Um, there will be uh, there will be instructions in Irish, and there will be some elements in the program which will be in Irish as well. And what does that translate to? Uh, well, now hold on a second. <laughs> I should also mention that Dewan Con is a name or word that we invented ourselves. We feel that that's appropriate because Irish is a very uh, uh, you know adjustable language. And um, that means uh, Down Con is World Con and Aeronaut means Irish. So Irish is a wonderful language, but actually perhaps that's a lot for all of you to take in. So I'd like to present you our name and logo. Dublin 2019 in Irish World Con. Isn't that much easier? Yeah. Okay, cool. And very beautiful, I think. So next now is to our guest of honour. Our first guest of honour is from Lurgan, Northern Ireland, and is an astrophysicist recognised for their work in science. They received many awards and honours, including being elected Pro-Chancellor of the University of Dublin, awarded an honorary doctorate in science by Queen's University Belfast and Trinity College Dublin, and as well as being honoured, awarded an honorary doctorate of the university by Dublin City University. A lifetime in science, working in science. The first person to observe and precisely analyze pulsars. I present Professor, Professor Dane Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Our next guest of honor has been active for some 50 years in our community. The first Worldcon was Bacon in 1968. Moving to New York in 1971, they were a freelancer working in the publishing industry, going full-time as an editor in 1984 at Ace Books. They rose through the ranks, senior editor, executive editor of science fiction and fantasy, senior executive editor and marketing director, and finally, editor-in-chief at Ace Rock Books before retiring in 2014. Originally from Pittsburgh, as well as his huge career editing, and being involved in fan activities in our community. They've also written on Buffy, Firefly, and True Blood. I present our next guest, who is here today. Isn't it awesome? <laughs> May I present to you, Ginger Buchanan. Even though they were both at Worldcon in 1967, <laughs> our next guest failed to meet. <laughs> but fate took a positive turn at a later opportunity when they met in London as fans travelled to the Heidelberg Worldcon in Germany. Active in fandom for over 50 years, they were very good and special friends to many Irish fans, such as Bob Shaw and James White. Between them, they've attended over 100 Easter cons. They've been repeatedly recognised and awarded within our community. Dublin 2019 and Irish Worldcon will be their first Irish convention, and we really look forward to welcoming them. I present Mary and Bill Burns. Our next guest lives in County Wicklow, Ireland. They've been a guest of honour at Opticon, the Irish National Science Fiction Convention, and have been frequently helped and supported Irish fan activities over the years. In actual fact, in the early days of Opticon, in the early 90s, at one stage, they designed an Opticon logo. Nominated two years running for the John W. Campbell Award after their first fantasy novel, they've also gained, gained great success with young adult fiction and writing in the world of Star Trek. Originally from Manhattan, other work includes writing for television such as Batman and My Little Pony. <laughs> I present the New York Times bestseller, Diane Dwayne. <laughs> so
so much fun. <laughs> it's much better than I expected. <laughs> a previous guest at, at Irish conventions, WarpCon and GaleCon. With others, they ran the convention newsletter from the New Orleans Worldcon, NOLACon 2. A game player for over 50 years, they started designing and writing games in 1976, and they had their first game published in 1977. Since then, their games have been hugely popular and continue to develop and release more all the time. After a Gale Con, a gaming convention in Ireland, they came back home with a flu. They caught a convention flu. This was memorialised in one of their games as Irish Flu. <laughs> a supporter of many fan activities, our next guest was the youngest game designer to be inducted into the Origins Hall of Fame by the Academy of Adventure Gaming, Arts and Design. I present Steve Jackson. Guest of honor has been a regular guest at Irish conventions such as Opticon, Mecon, Unicon, and Titancon, as well as being guest at FinCon, not in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> Living just outside Belfast, they moved with their family at the tender age of five to Ireland. A writer, their television work includes being the showrunner for the first series of Sesame Tree. This was a Northern Ireland version of Sesame Street. The first novel won the Locus Award, and they have received many other awards, including the Philip K. Dick Award for Best Collection, and the BSFA, the British Science Fiction Association Award, for Best Novel three times. In 2007, they won the Hugo for Best Novelette. Also present here, I'd like to present to you Ian MacDonald. Some of them won't, but that doesn't matter. But I would like to call the community who are here up to the front because you know it's a huge team effort. And they're just a representative portion of all the people who've helped us. So, uh, yes, yeah, some of us actually have a new t shirt. Yeah. Sorry, just taking clothes off. Taking clothes off. Yeah, how often are you here? So uh, here's our committee, and many of them now will turn around and show you our new t-shirt for Dublin 2019 and Irish World Cup. These will be available at our table, where you can also get lots of information, and of course you can join up down in the exhibits, so that will be happening straight away, and hopefully you like the t-shirt. Uh, it's got a selection of the artwork that we used over the, uh, over the time of our bid which just goes to show how much effort has gone in. All these different pieces, panels, represent a different stage of our bid when something was being done and we have some artwork to show it. So I'd like to thank all the committee who are here. Thank you very much indeed. You may all now return to your seats. And... Okay, uh, next we have uh, the point. Oh, oh there's, a pic oh, oh, there's the picture of our team, some of our other team. And, uh, you know, they're not here. And look, <laughs> Next, here's our price list side, slide. Here's our price list. Of note, we will be doing a first Worldcon membership, which we thought worked really well, as well as a young adult rate. We will also have a fantastic Dublin fund to assist people who need it to get to Dublin. Uh, we will have our progress report zero being handed out now in a few moments once I'm finished. They'll also be at the door for you if you want to get one as you leave. And all our details are in there. Next one. So that's it, I'm afraid. Uh, we just really look forward to welcoming you. Uh, we hope to host a terrific convention. Um, really, uh, all I can say is that uh, we look forward to seeing you at, at, at Dublin 2019 and Irish Worldcon. Um, we really want to host a fabulous world class convention and an amazing Worldcon. Thank you to everyone who voted, everyone who supported the bid. 
the Worldcon team here who's been so helpful and supportive, all the other people who've been involved who've helped us, we're just very, very grateful. It's been a great journey. Please come and join us in two years' time in Dublin, Ireland. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much and congratulations. The chair suggests that it would be better to dispense with the rest of question time here. We do have a lot of material. So uh, thank you very much. The next item would be the question time for the 2018 Worldcon, Worldcon 76. Um, Mr. Roche, are you here? Oh, you're okay. I'm here. Um, the chair suggests that perhaps about five minutes for Mr. Roche to give a short presentation, and that any that really is not necessary to do question time here, we did have uh, the Spanish Inquisition as well. Is there anyone who objects with dispensing with the rest of question time, but other than that? Hearing none, the chair uh, recognizes Mr. Roche and asks those people who are having side conversations to refrain from doing so. If you do want to discuss things about the new Dublin Rollcon, you really need to take it outside. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Good morning. Is this, is this picking my voice up adequately for those who are in the back of the room? Is that better? Um, good morning. Um, I did bring my slides from the Spanish Inquisition in case you missed the announcement. We have announced two new guests of honor. First, uh, two slides forward please, is John Picasso, artist. And second is uh, musician and technologist Frank Hayes. In terms of other news that's important to fandom in general, our rates are increasing on September 1st. So we can skip past the picture of all of our guests of honor. I do want those up on the screen. Our attending adult rate increases to $210 on September 1st. Our active duty first responder and young adult rates uh, also increase as does a child rate. So I want to remind you all, our system allows you to register with a deposit and lock in your attending rate at the lower price. If you have not done so, I encourage you to do so, or we will happily take more money from you after September 1st. And the other bit of uh, news that we described is we have signed all of our hotel contracts. We have approximately 1,400 rooms in our walk. 600 are in the Hilton and Marriott, which are attached to the convention center. Another 600 are in the Fairmont, which is about 800 meters away. That is where our parties will be located because even though it is more expensive, there are more suites and the lunch rooms that actually are large enough for hosting parties. I do note that uh, in translation from one format to another, that list of names came unstuck from its pointers. That's why it looks a little funny. Um, the additional hotels, two are directly across the street from the convention center. That is the Hyatt Place and the historic St. Clair whose owner keeps changing, but whose name never will because the sign is a historic monument. <laughs> and then finally, uh, a few blocks away, we have the AC Hotel by Marriott. So if you want to stay a little bit further away from the craziness downtown, from all of us being there, and are willing to walk a few blocks, uh, the AC Marriott is up there in the corner to the right, or my right, your left, on the screen. Um, those are all of the uh, items I brought to you. Um, I did just check. We are currently at about 2,400 members. Uh, 1,700 are full attending members. And uh, that's where we are. Things seem to be progressing. We've been happily selling memberships all weekend. You may not see paper forms. That's because we're not using them. We will happily assist you with our electronic system at the uh, convention. And that's all I have to say, unless somebody now has a very question. <laughs> We're going to dispense with the rest of question time without objection. Questions can be best taken down on the table where people who actually still have their voices left can answer them. Thank you, Mr. Roche. <laughs> Last bit of site selection business. Is there a representative of the, I believe, the only bidder for 2020 is New Zealand? Am I right? There's, no, there's nobody came out of left field or... Not yet. 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 
Peter want to speak? Yeah. You're it? Yep. Okay. Dr. Adams, representing the New Zealand in 2020 bid for, uh, you were recognized for not to exceed five minutes. Okay, I, I, I don't have much. We, we gave a presentation at the Finnish Inquisition. For those who haven't seen us around this week, uh, we have finally settled on a city, um, which will be Wellington. Uh, we're still negotiating with two sites in Wellington. Part of the reason we're still negotiating is they're still looking at building a new conference centre there and we're keeping our options open. Now, I want to stress, we have two viable sites in Wellington, which we're negotiating in detail with, um, but we're still keeping our options open on this uh, new conference centre, which will be a better site than the two existing ones. Um, we have a core team of New Zealanders who are very enthusiastic, but not necessarily very uh, experienced with Open and Worldcoms. They are all aware that they will need a lot of help from overseas, um, as you can see, a Brit who lives in Japan is uh, up here presenting for them. Um, if you have um, detailed questions, uh, we still have a table downstairs, including some of the New Zealand fans, but also some of the uh, overseas fans who are helping join us. Um, we hope to see you all again through the year at various conventions. We'll be uh, running promotion desks at, and of course, next year in uh, San Jose uh, at Worldcon 76. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Adams, and that brings us to the end of site selection. Once again, if you have questions of a bid, you really should that, that do it best to take them to their bid table. We have now reached the point where we are going to go into recess. Now, I, if, just before I do so, I'm going to reiterate, if you, uh, we're going to be out recessed until at least 11 o'clock, so you don't need to come back until then. If you're going to be here for the World Con Chairs photo shoot, great, but we are going to also need the first two rows of seats cleared out of the way and rearranged in order to do the photo. This meeting is in recess until 11, at least 11 o'clock. It is 11 o'clock, and the second main business meeting of the World Science Fiction Society meeting at the 75th World Science Fiction Convention will be in order. I'm not going to go through the introductions, by now you ought to know. Welcome back. We have three hours, or really two hours and 45 minutes to, for today. Tomorrow we have five hours. If you don't get through everything here today, we're here tomorrow as well. Uh, we should leave that. I've got that slide here. We are first going to recap on slide 53 to recap what happened earlier in this convention so you understand what happened. Uh, some of you were here. The Mark Protection Committee elected the uh, re-elected the incumbents for three year for three-year terms. The nitpicking and fly specking committee uh, members were reappointed, as were the Worldcom Runners Guide Editorial Committee members and as was the formalization of the Long List Entries Committee, which was continued and reappointed. The YA, uh, the YA Award Study Committee is, uh, was not reappointed. It wasn't necessary. That committee will expire at the end of this business meeting, uh, this year's full time. Next slide, 54. The No Vanishing Business Committee report was, uh, were, their report was approved on Friday. The Hugo Awards Study Committee uh, had all of the items uh, that would amend the novel best related and dramatic presentation Hugo Awards. All those items were referred to it along with a, a lot of other subjects. That committee will study this and report back next year. Uh, the contact information, if you, already, if you do not already know how to reach Mr. Doherty, uh, will be in the minutes. And those will be published not too long from now, but also not this week, but not immediately. And the place to find those is on the wispus.org website. Um, is under the rules, rules and constitution section is where we put, we put the new minutes there and all the new documents there. Uh, 55, then, right. The Worldcon and NASPIC financial reports are in your minutes. There is no time or any reason or any actual allowance for uh, 
reporting from them. If you can contact them now, the contact information is in their reports as required by rule. That brings us to constitutional amendments. Some of them have already been dealt with, or in one way or another, but believe it or not, after everything happened, we're right back at the beginning of Section C again. <laughs> and that brings us to Best Series, which is up for ratification, and it has had added to, or, or uh, moved on it, an amendment at, that is on page 11 of your agenda called Best Series Clarification. And this is moved to uh, amend the base proposal to replace the word multi-volume with multi-installment, to replace three volumes with three installments, and to replace the word one, the word one volume with one installment, and also uh, in a later section to replace additional volumes with additional installments. The copy on page 11 shows you the revised wording with, uh, if the amendment were to be adopted. The chair rules that this is not a greater change. It's also not a lesser change as well. It's, it is the same scope of change. That is, the, the, the scope stays the same. That means, in the, in the opinion of the chair, should this amendment pass, uh, this, uh, the amended proposal can be ratified this year. Very well. Ms. Secor? The uh, debate time on the amendment is four minutes allocated, two minutes each way. The chair recognizes Ms. Seaford. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kate Seaford. Um, I noticed in the discussion. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Was better? Yeah. Okay. Better. I'm Kate Seaford. Um, I noticed in a lot of the discussions this year around Best Series, people were very confused by the word volume. Is a volume a standalone work? Do you actually have to put out a, a whole new book to be eligible to be new books? Because a lot of people work in shorter lengths. They write novellas, they write installments. So, and I talked about it, and I talked about it to a bunch of people, and I said, what word? What word means the same thing that we're trying to get to with volumes, which is a new entry of words into this universe, but does not imply that it has to be a standalone work that is published with its own set of covers? And I hit upon installment which I think doesn't actually change the intent of the award, but does clarify that if you publish two novellas and a book and you happen to hit the word length, then yes, you are now re-eligible. But it's just a cleanup change. Thanks. Does anyone wish to speak against this amendment? Is there anyone else who wishes to speak at all toward this? Is there any objection to adopting this amendment? Hearing none, item C.1 is adopted, the wording is changed accordingly, and thus the basic proposal is changed as noted in the proposal. That brings us to the basic proposal as amended on for best series. This has a debate time of 10 minutes, of course, divided e evenly. Representing the proponents of the proposal, the chair recognizes Dr. Mendelssohn. Got it right, didn't I? I would like to. I didn't catch the last bit, but I assume it was nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm here to represent the series Hugo. Sorry? You need to give your name when you Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm new to this. My name is Dr. Farah Mendelssohn. Okay? I'm here to present, represent the series Hugo Group. Um, and I just want to explain that I'm not actually a fan of series fiction, and I think that's relevant in this area. I became involved with this as a consequence of my work on the YA group, which involved me actually looking at the other awards and looking at how they functioned. And the longer I looked at them, the more I came to feel that there was actually a genuine gap. Um, the challenges of series were a significant omission. Series fiction have their own arc and their own challenges. Even where novels within the series are rewarded, it's still not the same as rewarding a single story. And I did have a lot of fun, actually. Um, series fiction writers, when they're debating series fiction, write 3,000 word emails and say part two is in the next email. Yeah. <laughs> um, as I said, I don't like this. I can't for the life of me understand why you'd want to wait five years for the next part, but that's not the point. Hugo categories are not about what we do or don't like. They're about representing the scope of our field. 
And one of the things that's become a significant element of our field over the years is the series, fi series fiction. Current categories in written fiction are all dictated by length and all assume a complete thing. When a book does win from a series, it's often seen as representative, but it's not necessarily a book you could hand to somebody and say, this is a great book if you've never read anything before. You aren't going to give part four of George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire as a representative of a Hugo novel. Uh, novel. Um, and a, as a consequence, a highly successful series can be at a serious disadvantage, both in nominations as in, and in voting. And even where, as with last night's winner, the novels are complete, the full story can build across the series to end in a very different place, as with last night's winner. My husband actually wrote the book on Bouchard, and it, you can see the change in the thing. It's not the first novel. Um, and we all know that there are plenty of series that have become trite to collapse. To sustain a series is a significant achievement. And furthermore, and I say this as somebody who's lost of quite a few Hugos, the nomination list is every bit as important as the winner. It showcases new writers. It allows people to see what people are reading. Now, we looked at the way other categories are working, and I know this is being discussed, and we've put in requirements that prevent the list of nominees becoming simply a rotor. I was going to read these aloud, but I noticed they're in the paperwork, and you can go look, and you can all read. Um, that's why we're here. So we've tried to make sure that there is a, a very clear mechanism for bringing in new names, for eligibility requirements, and two crucial things were considered. Nominees, sorry, nominators should not have to try to figure out, does this fit? It either meets the rules or it doesn't. The same for the Hugo Committee, shouldn't be agonizing over, is this in the right category? And those nominated shouldn't think, oh, my book shouldn't be here. So we wanted to make it as clear as possible. Um, the categories proved extremely popular. I took a look at last night's vote. It actually got one more vote than best novel, which I think is quite an achievement, actually. Um, and we do have a subset clause. If interest in the category or the quality of nominations drops, the proposal has passed, uh, can be removed with a vote in 2021. By that point, we'll have four clear years data to actually consider whether the category is working. So my essential advocacy for this is, there are more and more serious fiction on the shelves. We know it's very popular. We know people read it. And we feel quite strongly as a group that we should be representing the field as it exists now. And for this, I ask you to support this, this category. Thank you. Here, here. Uh, speaker against. Question. question. Uh, the member as an inquiry. Come there. By the way, that that was four minutes and thirty seconds. Thank you. Come, come over The member will state their inquiry. Uh, Andrew Adams. Uh, given that we've had a special category this year, um, representing effectively the same things. Um, and that this is a category with very specific um, rules to prevent um, the repeated uh, occurrence of the same series. Uh, I, I wonder whether, if we ratify this this year, um, the series which won this year would or would not be eligible next year. I, I would like to hear what the what the proponent's opinion is on the subject before I rule on it. I assumed not. The plan is that the word count starts again. <clears throat> yeah, the chair has, deci has decided that he declines to rule on the subject. The decision would be left in the hands of the Hugo Award administrator for next year. Would he care to um, No, he would not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to remind people that just raising your hand is not going to be enough to me to call on uh, you. Were, had you. Had you been seated and then were rising to speak on this issue? Were you, were you moving to appeal this ruling of the chair? Then, then I'm not going to ask for such Are you moving to appeal the ruling of the chair? 
the ruling of the chair is that it's the up to the administrator of, the, of next year's award, and I think we're going to argue about that. Um, yes. I think I am going to argue. Uh, <laughs> Please. Yes, I know. I know. Always been trying to do it. The ruling of the chair. The ruling of the chair is that the decision on that on the question raised, which is, would next year's basically would uh, the, the the winner of this year's best series be eligible next year. The chair has declined to rule on the subject himself and has stated that it is up to next year's new award administrator. There has been an appeal to that ruling. Is there a second to the appeal? Second. second. Okay. The question is, is the chair's ruling that it is solely up to next year's new administrator correct? The chair believes that we do not have enough authority or, or knowledge here to make this decision and it was not the same category, it was a special Hugo, even though it used the same uh, wording. Uh, by the way, it's five minutes total in this, which we're going to use up some another time. Uh, Mr. Yallo, to speak against the rule. You're probably better off to go to the lectern, really. Yeah. The reason that I am, I believe the chair is incorrect. Sorry, Ben Yallo. The reason I believe the chair is incorrect is grounded specifically in the exact wording of the exclusion clause. The exclusion clause says specifically, has not previously won under 3.3.x. Since in this case, the work that won last night was not awarded under 3.3.x, I believe that it would therefore still be eligible and not be covered by the exclusion in the new 3.3.x that is proposed. A speech in favor of the chair's ruling, Ms. Hayes. <coughs> Lisa Hayes. I believe the chair's ruling should stand because it is leaving this option open to the administrator. He is not making a hard decision one way or the other. You have to let the administrators interpret the rules. That's their job. Here, here. Uh, a speech against the chair's ruling. Hold the question. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, um, it's a motion to end the debate and bring the appeal to a vote. Second. Is there anyone else that uh, has moved and seconded? Is there anybody who wishes to continue to debate the chair's ruling? Ready to show your hands? Hands down. Any objection to ending the debate? Very well. On the appeal. All those who believe the chair's ruling that it is up to next year's Hugo Award administrator to make this decision, raise your hands. Hands down. Those opposed to the chair's ruling, raise your hands. Hands down. The affirmative has it. The chair's ruling is sustained. Dr. Adams. Uh, a moment. How much time does it have? We've got to work out the time. Uh, well, okay. You're speaking against? Yes, I, I'm offering an amendment. Oh, you're offering an amendment. Okay. What you speaking against? Okay. There's about four and a half minutes left. Still, Andrew Adams, uh, I would like to offer an amendment in the uh, exclusion. Um, clause to state that the uh, winner of the uh, best series special Hugo category at Worldcon 75 uh, be um, excluded um, for the same length of time it would otherwise be excluded had it won under this. Uh, that's the, 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 member is, the member is moving to add wording that uh, it was actually a provision that would uh, exclude the winner of the best series novel given at this year's Worldcon from exclude The chair rules the motion out of order. Yeah. It, is, it is mechanically impossible <coughs> on the grounds that the chair would, would, is going to rules that would increase the scope of the amendment and require a following a further year of ratification, and that would make it utterly meaningless because it only affects next year's Worldcon. All right, we're at a speech against best series. Uh, yeah, let me, Dr. Lurie first. You want, you're going to need to come a little closer in. You sit over there if you would. It's really very hard for me to see anything outside this wedge. I, I remain Dr. Lurie. 
Uh, and while I do actually read some serious fiction and like it, and I am sympathetic to Dr. Mendelssohn's arguments, as a voter, uh, there is no way between the time the nominations are announced and when we have to submit our ballots to become familiar with six series, six novels, six novellas, six novelettes, six short stories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I was personally familiar with three of the six nominated series, and there was no way that I could possibly become familiar enough with the other three to vote intelligently. Uh, also, it's not clear whether I'm supposed to be judging the stuff that was published in the previous year, as you do for other Hugos, or the series as a whole, and whether the, the items from last year should carry more weight than the beginning part of the series. And for this reason, I am opposed to this Hugo. There is no time left for speeches in favor of this uh, proposal. Uh, for what purpose? I'm going to call on you. What was your purpose? An inquiry. An inquiry. The member will come to the microphone and state their inquiry. And name. And name. And federal. Hi, it's Paul Federer. Um, so my inquiry is, uh, the wording has specified here, um, does that exclude a graphic series? from being eligible. Because in the single item, yeah, short story, novel, or whatever, categories, so there is an equivalent graphic um, category to a single volume. Uh, the, chair said, the chair's opinion on this is that only the word count is defining it. I suppose if you had a graphic series that had 240,000 words in it. Uh, that, that's the answer to your question, is, is that it's eligible, but only by word count. Uh, point of information, it's in the minutes of uh, Andrade and Still. Yes. Um, it, it's in the minutes of a previous uh, business meeting. That question has been asked before, and exactly the same question in response to the chair has given. If a graphic novel has sufficient words in okay, it. Okay, that's, yeah, that's fine. I think we got the point there. How much time do we have for debate against? Is somebody moving to extend debate? Yeah. Okay, I want to make sure that I was. A minute and 40 seconds against. Mr. Two, two minutes 40 seconds against. Mr. Cronin Call question. Second. I'd rather let one more speech against before that. Would the member withdraw their motion? Absolutely. Okay. One more, yeah. Uh, actually, I, I was going to call a minute. Okay, the secretary's trying to get caught up here. Uh, I was rather, uh, no offense intended, but I was going to call uh, on uh, uh, Mr. White over here. I probably will at some point here, yes. Um, Nicholas Weiss, this year's Hugo Administrator. I'll be brief so that the, the other speaker can have, can have her turn as well. Um, I agree with everything that Dr. Dury has said. I want to make one other point, which is that the, the joy of the Hugos is celebrating the work of the previous year, the best novel, the best art, the best fan activity. Um, we're really changing the meaningfulness of that if we reward instead work that actually goes back decades rather than the last 12 months. We need to think very, very carefully about what that means in terms of the Hugo for 2019, 2018, um, whether that's actually celebrating the work of the previous year or not. So I just want to make that one point very quickly. And I believe we're now under one minute. Okay, well, in that case, that's not a scene longer, I apologize. <laughs> Intended. <laughs> At this point, the chair will recognize the motion to end the debate. Are, uh, is there a second to end the debate? Um, a show of hands. Who still wishes to speak to this question? Hands down. All those in favor of ending the debate and bringing the ratification to a vote, raise your hands. Hands down. Those opposed? Hands down. In the opinion of the chair, there is less than two thirds in the affirmative. That leaves a, a minute and 40 seconds of debate time. The fail motion fails. Yes, now I'll call on you. There's only time left to speeches against. There's two minutes left, sorry. Um, I'm Anne Marie Rudolph. Um, I do agree again with our uh, the previous comments against in that there is not sufficient time to evaluate nominees properly. Um, I also believe that there are would not be sufficient eligible works that are Hugo-worthy after a few years of um, awarding this uh, 
series award. Granted, there are lots of series, but Hugo uh, Worthy is a different level of publication. Another speech against Mr. Yellow. I in part agree and in part disagree. I think that there are enough Hugo Worthy series, but I am in great sympathy with the responsibilities that would result for the Hugo administrator. Some poor Hugo administrator at some stage is going to have to decide what is qualified and disqualified and say the 1632 series. How do you define what is in that 1632 series? How do you figure out which, whether a sub-series of that <coughs> that might include 240,000 words or a more global nomination that says everything in 1632? Are they, the, are they nominating the same works? What is excluded? How are we defining it? I think that the question Given the way modern series evolved with sub-series and things that could be considered their own series makes the award difficult, if not impossible, to administer. Here, here. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak against this? Okay. There's 15 seconds debate time remaining. Mr. McCarty. I'm Dave McCarty. Uh, my one point is that in all other fiction categories, we work very hard to make sure that we're judging complete works, and we cannot do that in this category. Things are at various stages of completion, and it makes it an unfair contest. Time for debate has expired. The question is on the ratification of item C.1 uh, as amended, that series. All those in favor of ratifying this motion, raise your hands. Hands down. Those opposed, raise your hands. Hands down, the chair is in doubt. We will do a serpentine vote. <laughs> a reminder here. This is the first, for some of you, this is the first time you have seen this vote system working. The way this will work is I will call upon all those people who are in favor of this motion to stand. If you cannot stand, indicate it a different, another way. We will start on this side of the room, and we will begin going up and down the aisles, back and forth, like a snake, which is why it's called serpentine. And you will count off one, two, and so on. And as you count your number, sit down. This also helps you make sure the people around you have, to have gotten them done. We'll then do the center section, and then the right section. Once that is done, we will then call for those opposed, and we will repeat the process. And we will always start with the head table. Yes, question? Privilege. You need to tell the people who can't stand what to do. Uh, indicate by, it, not everybody can even raise their hands, but if you want to use the blue paper, hold up the blue sheet of paper if you need to. Please hold up the blue yes. sheet of paper. Um, tellers will help on that case. Again, try and indicate to the people around you we're not trying to exclude anybody, we just need to be able to be sure that you're trying to vote. And if we get to your section there, then call out, and if there's a short confusion, if the same two numbers get called out at the same time, stop and sort it out. Any questions on how the vote works? Is there anybody here who needs one of these blue sheets of paper? I don't see anybody. Oh, sorry. Uh, could, could someone bring? Yes, thank you, Kate. We've got plenty. We've got lots of those. Okay, that's voting sheet. All right, very well then. On the question of ratifying C.1, all those in favor of ratifying this proposal, please rise. Is there anybody on the head table voting? Then we will start over here. One, two, three, four, five. Quiet, please. Just seven. Stop. We're at seven. I really need people to not talk during this. Okay. Seven. On that 12 on that side, and let's... 13. 14. 15. 16. 18. 19. 20. 21. 22. 23. 24. 
That was, I heard 27 was the last number I heard. 28 please you are number 28 everybody beyond who had a number above 28 stand up okay. we will restart this is voting in to ratify the motion number 28 37 okay come on wait till they get to the front of the room please Fifty-one in the affirmative. All of those opposed to the ratification, please rise. We will start on the head table at my left. Two. Two. We have two there. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. On this vote, there are 51 in the affirmative and 39 in the negative. The affirmative has it. The proposal is ratified. It takes effect at the end of this Worldcon and will be first presented as a regular category at next year's Worldcon. Note that it has to be re-ratified by the 2021 business meeting and that the motion to re-ratify it shall be automatically placed on the ballot. Thank you. How are we as to time? Did you, need a, you need a technical timeout, yes. This meeting is in recess for one minute. The meeting will return to order. Item C2 was ratified on Friday. Item C3 was ratified on Friday. The next item is on your agenda as C. Dot four, starting on page 13, three-stage voting or the only winning move is not to play. The secretary is asking me to hold up for a moment. The chair is one of the co-authors of this motion and intends to speak in debate and therefore recuses himself from the debate. Mr. Eastlake. Hi there. So this is Donald Eastlake. I'm acting chair now. Uh, the debate time on this motion is 20 minutes, so we've handed this out in advance. Uh, we've had several days to read this, so I assume I don't no need to actually read the motion. Uh, there is, uh, I already said there's 20 minutes in the debate. Um, so we should proceed to a speech uh, to make us the maker of the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In, in the interests of um, getting the most value out of the debate, I don't propose to recap the details of how this process works. Hopefully, you're all familiar with it from last year. I first talk about. Uh, sorry, Colin Harris. Um, first, focus just on really the, the key questions we I feel we should be considering individually as a group as to whether we should ratify this motion at this stage. Um, we clearly have a bit more evidence about both the effect of 
EPA talks on over the last year, and of the behaviour of some of the groups whose actions brought us to consider these changes over the last few years. 3SB, in essence, is a targeted strategy for excluding inappropriate candidates from the ballot. It effectively brings the no award test forward to before the final voting stage. And we proposed it on the basis that any algorithmic approach, such as EPH, however good, can, is always vulnerable to some degree of gaming, whether that is the incorporation of sort of human shield nominees in a slate or changes of slate tactics. Um, 3SB effectively places the responsibility for saying this is an inappropriate candidate on the voters as a group. I want to be clear that we didn't do this because we think 3SB of itself is an improvement to the Hugo's. What I mean by that is you can make an argument for EPH, whether you agree with it or not, that it is inherently a better way of getting diversity, etc. We do not hide from the fact that 3SB was something forced on us as a response um, by people who are bad, bad actors, essentially, against our rewards. Um, the question at this point is, you know, is it still needed? If you believe that there is a significant chance of people coming back with a very targeted attack on the awards that would need this stronger response, then you should be voting in favour, so we have this in our arsenal. If you believe that the measures are retaken, and perhaps just the loss of interest in campaign the sort of slate behaviour, because that's basically it takes a lot of effort to do that every year, that we really don't need this to protect the awards, then um, I would suggest it's possible to let it lapse. And we always have an option to bring it back in future, but of course we'd have to restart the two-year process. The next and probably last main point I'd make is this. One of the questions we all have to ask ourselves, and that we asked last year, is what is our success criteria? Why, what do we consider a good ballot? And one of the concerns with EPH last year was, the argument was, well, we'll guarantee you always get a couple of good nominees, no matter what the slate tactics are. I think most of us felt that a picture of years and years ahead where half the ballot was slates wasn't really appealing as a definition of success, even if you know the one or two good candidates shine, shone through. Um, clearly this year what has changed is that the slates have been less effective and they have switched because of EPH to more bullet voting. So they just put up one candidate per um, category. And of course, a lot of those candidates made the final ballot. And if we look at, say, Editor Longform, where um, Patrick Nielsen Hayden was displaced by Fox Day, um, because of EPH, then you can consider, you know, is that acceptable? There are only a couple of those on the ballot out of 100 finalists. Um, we each have to decide, is that okay? Or do we still want 3SB, given the administrative price and the politics around it and so on? So hopefully I've laid out there the things you have in your mind um, as to whether we need this now or not, and I encourage you all to reflect on that. Point of inquiry. Point of inquiry. Okay, clear now. Uh, PRK, Perky Road, Henley. Uh, point of inquiry, Mr. Chairman. Would an amendment to allow three stage voting to be at the discretion of the Hugo administrator be considered a greater, equal, or lesser change in scope? Um, I would rule that. Uh, I would rule that would be a lesser scope. So that it would be more. So, uh, sorry, uh, I would rule that the, a change to make it at the discretion of the Hugo administrator would mean that it would be only in effect some of the time and therefore it would be a change of lesser scope. So such an amendment would be in order. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I guess it was just an inquiry, so that was just an opinion. So opinions are not appealable. It has to be an actual ruling on something actually done for. I don't think we need this. I'm very angry. I don't think we need this. I think that. Yes, while well, Patrick Nielsen Hayden might have been displaced by the bulleted slate vote, 
Uh, there were only, there would have, before the changes that we just recently made, there would have only been five people on the ballot and he wouldn't have been on anyway. Um, with the six, can with six candidates getting on the ballot, uh, if we can be sure that five good candidates or reasonable candidates make the ballot, I think that's good enough. Uh, if they are one-sixth of the nominators, they should get one-sixth of the things on the ballot. Um, and I don't see this as a problem that needs solving. I think we should live with the changes that we have instituted for several years and see how it works out before we make more changes. Here, here. Point of privilege. Point of privilege. Yes. Could you please be clear when you're looking for speeches? I think some people were unclear that you were coming to take a speech last time. What? 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 He didn't realize there was debate going on. He thought it was still about the order of the chair. Okay. Sorry. Uh, that, that, the, the last speech and debate was against. It should be counted against the negative time. And the next would be a speech in favor. Say your name. <laughs> Kevin Stanley. Uh, Mr. Chairman, how much debate time remains in favor? About six minutes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, in 2015, when I presided over the WSFIS business meeting, I had the choice of presiding over the meeting or submitting substantially this proposal. I chose to preside over the meeting. To some extent, I regret that decision. I really believe this is a method that is in more in keeping with the member-driven decision process that we as a society have stuck to throughout the history of the Hugo Awards as far as I've known about them. It's not a strong administrator holding a club and, and, and arbitrarily disqualifying works. It's not mathematics that are understandable if you work at it hard enough, but perhaps a bit difficult to follow. It's relatively easy to follow what's happening here. That's one of its benefits. It has safeguards built into it to prevent small groups from overwhelming the process. It has, for lack of a better term, a quorum requirement. Enough people have to participate. It has a supermajority requirement that requires 60% of those voting to say no to kill a work. It is highly unlikely that a small group of dedicated people will disqualify a work. But I also want to mention that there are side effects in this, if you like, that are a benefit to the entire administration process, particularly in as much as we have moved the membership eligibility deadline for vote being a member to participate back to the end of the previous year, putting one month into the process. This does take some time out of the entire cycle. There's no doubt about that. But what it does do is it takes some of the things that administrators have had to do very quickly and in secret between the close of nominations and the opening of the final ballot, and puts much of it out in the open and speeds it up. The top 15 list, that's the shorthand term, I hope you understand it's more complicated than that, but the top 15 lists, you don't have to get people's permission to be on them, you just announce them. During the period of the three-stage voting process, the administrator will be contacting all 15 or so potential finalists in these categories and getting their acceptances and checking their eligibility if they couldn't do it or earlier. And, and furthermore, they can then ask people for help if they can't find things. It's really difficult for a Hugo administrator during that closed period, I believe it's called PERDA in the British system, um, to go off and say, oh, do you happen to know where notable author is contactable without letting the cat out of the bag? <laughs> it's also difficult to, while you're letting people know they're a potential finalist, to keep them from bragging about it. This stops that from happening. This, we know who the potential finalists are. They're somewhere in that top 15. In effect, it crowdsources the eligibility and contact information. That's actually a great benefit to the process, 
and does and, and in effect it actually takes stuff that you were doing in one part of the process and puts it into another. It does not actually lengthen the process as long as you might think. For all of these reasons, I believe this is a great benefit to our process overall, and I urge a, a vote in favor of it. Thank you. Vote again. That's what I speech again, sir. Test this thing. Uh, can you see me? And your name? My name is Kate Seacorp. I have a couple of objections to this, but honestly, I just think that it's introducing a political stage to the Hugos. We don't like the politics. Every time somebody brings politics into the Hugos, we stand up and say, no, this is not the game we're playing. And now we're looking at this. And we're introducing an explicitly political stage where we're asking people to reject works not on the basis of their artistic merit, but at least partially because we look at them and go, oh, we don't like the people that put those in. I'm not convinced that that's philosophically aligned with what we're trying to do. My other concern is we are now telling the people who want to gain the Hugos, this is the floor you have to reach. Here you go. If you can get to this number, hmm, you can be part of this and you can kick out good things. I'm concerned that this is going to have interesting bad side effects that have perhaps not been considered sufficiently. Thank you. Speech in favor? Please state your name. Yeah. Uh, I'm Dave Wallace, and as someone who is uh, one of the co-sponsors of EPH and EPH Plus, I welcome this amendment. I think that it is very complementary to what we are trying to do with some of these other anti-slating measures. And it will help restore the honor of being a finalist. The problem with what, what we've had in the last um, few years is that by putting essentially really junk nominations out there, and, and I, I don't necessarily need to cite the exact ones, but you know, dinosaur, porn, or whatever, it, it takes away from some of the honor of actually being on the finalist list, you know, and it, it also displaces more serious works that people might actually support. So I think this is one more tool in the toolkit. I don't think there's one magic bullet that solves all our problems, but I think this, in cooperation with the other measures that we've already passed, will in fact help to improve the quality of the nominations and. You know, if somebody's putting something out there just for the title, for the explicit political purpose of having that title on the list of finalists, it allows us to strike that and minimize the amount of politics that's connected with the actual finalist list. Thank you. Linda Denneroff, my question is, is, is 3SV intended to replace um, EPH or EPH plus, or is it intended to be an adjunct? That seems like it's, it's uh, as currently proposed, it will adjunct, be an adjunct. Uh, so I don't think it's, you know, no, you're speaking speak in, okay. As currently proposed, it, will, it wouldn't be an adjunct unless further action is taken by the business meeting. Um, so we'll for a speech uh, against. Um, <coughs> Your name. Thank you, Chair. My name is Nicholas Martin. I'm this year's Hugo Administrator. Um, I want to just make three points very quickly. First of all, uh, in response to the point about the burden of work on administrators in uh, researching the eligibility and contact details for finalists, what I did this year was that I had a research team to whom I gave a very, very long list, which included the top six, the market top six, and they did their research and their method on the day. I was able to contact pretty much everybody almost overnight. I and mean, if you plan ahead, these things are possible. Um, I actually am one of the signatories of this resolution. I have changed my position. I now oppose it. I oppose it because it was not clear a year ago that EPH would pass or that it would work. EPH did pass. It did work. This resolution is attempting to address a problem that has already been solved and, in fact, a problem that has gone away. The sand poppies are no longer active. Vox Day this morning posts on the blog, we've done our part, we can let inertia do most of the work from here. Um, you know, this is not an issue that we're immediately going to be faced with again. I think, I don't like this as a, a, a political act. Um, I think I agree with Ms. Secor that this can be used against um, the targets for my, uh, of opportunity for minorities. 
And I also believe that purely on the technicalities, we have very little evidence that the thresholds that are set in the, in the amendments, 60% and uh, 600 votes, we know that we have very little evidence that these are in fact going to be the right thresholds and we may face further fine tuning to get it right in the future. I don't think the credibility of the Hugo Awards is, is assisted by continual rule changing to fight against enemies who have already told us that they're going away and I urge you to oppose this resolution. Thank you. How much time is Second? No, I don't second. <laughs> <laughs> we have 40 seconds for and um, 6 minutes 20 seconds against. Okay. Uh, we should call the recognition now. Yeah, there's 40 seconds. Sorry, there's 40 seconds available for speeches in favour of a minute 40. No, no, six minutes. Six minutes in favour. Sorry, six minutes for speeches against. 20 seconds against. Okay, I recognise Lisa Hayes and move to call the question. Is there a second? Second. All those in favour. Uh, 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 Right. All those who wish to speak, sorry, I was, I was saying the wrong thing. Who wish to speak, hold your hand up so you can see what the situation is. All those in favor of calling the question, please raise your hand. Thank you. All those opposed. I believe there is less than two thirds in favor, so the question is not called. The next uh, speech will be a speech in favor. Yeah. If it's alternate, please stand in Oh, you can stand in front of the family. Stephen Cooper. Uh, I just wonder if the two options you put forward at the very beginning of actually pa re re passing the um, option of the change or rejecting it are the only two options. Is there a way to actually carry this over to next year so that we can actually see what the results are? There is uh, not. Uh, putting it under yeah. the major change There is currently no such mechanism in the constitutional amendment provisions. Uh, okay, so appeal is there a second to the appeal the ruling of the chair? Quick, quick, yes. information. What? Um, Andrew Adams, at a previous business meeting I asked that similar question and it was pointed out although there is no explicit parliamentary mechanism, there is a motion mechanism um, which is that you propose a sunrise clause. Uh, moreover, there yes. um, is. That's not the question that was asked, but that is correct, I think. Um, so you still want to appeal back? Moreover, there is a motion to do exactly that um, on the floor for another motion, for another measure in the agenda. Which one? Which one? Uh, the motion to um, put a, uh, I believe, EPH plus in passive mode, such that it has to be activated each year. You mean there's a sunrise provision for it? Yes, uh, yes. Okay, that's, I'm sorry, that's not what I interpreted your question to me. Um, I will draw it Okay, so a speech in favor of the uh, ratification of the. Yeah. yeah, 40 seconds. Uh, Ron Lutz. A uh, couple of, it, of comments. Uh, first of all, uh, from a technical perspective, uh, Three-stage voting is going to be very easy to implement if that is any of your concern, not that any of the people speaking against have brought that up. As the person who will be the first person implemented, that is not an issue. Secondly, I do not trust Theodore Beale to keep his word. He okay. has here, here. continued to treat the Hugo Awards as a true toy for the last several years. Just because he posted on his blog he is not going to do so, I don't trust him to not go back on that word six months from now and look at whichever method we have for nominations next year and decide to play games with us again like he has continued to do for the last three years. Right. This gives us... Okay. You're trying to go to that speech. <laughs> speech again. Move to amend. Uh, yes. Um, Microphone. Can you state your name? Thank you. Stephen Bauer. Um, based on the conversation earlier, um, I'd like to move to amend to insert at the discretion of the site selection administrator for a qualification around. Site selection administrator? Uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the Hugo administrator. <laughs> 
Is there a second for the second? Second. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair. Sure. They probably need some. Yeah. I, 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 I think the wording may need to be more complex. The reason the chair wants to, uh, the reason, no, chair, the reason I'm moving a point of order is actually, before it is stated, I would ask the member to change it to the administering world con because we do not explicitly call have a Hugo I have no right to right. because we don't have to create a Hugo Award Administration Committee. So the administering world con. No objection. All right. Is the guys, in there's no objection to that change. The change is to insert at the discretion of the administering world con. So this would be how much total time is remaining? Okay, so although the is five minutes out of that five minutes that is available for debate on the five minutes and ten seconds Ah, five minutes out of the remaining five minutes and ten seconds is available for debate on the amendment. Uh, speech in favor of the amendment. State of Belgium. Um, we need weapons that are available to us to um, deal with threats to the Hugo integrity, to the, the process and the results of the, the voting. That doesn't mean we should be using them at all times. They need to be available to us, but we shouldn't actually have to shoot everything that we need. Speech again. Still Ben Yarrow. The reason that I oppose this is because 3SB is already, as Dr. Lurie stated, and as Ms. Secor stated, becoming a political question. This makes it even more political, and it puts the Yugo administrator right in the heart of the politics. It says to the Yugo administrator, if you think you want to exclude something, well, you can go ahead and do it, and if you think that the nominees are good, well, you don't. Boy, I hate to be a Hugo administrator who has to get up in front of the public and say, well, these are the guys I like, these are the guys I don't like, so I decided to use the hammer. Here, here. Here, here. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, member will say their inquiry. Kevin Stanley, Mr. Chairman, in the opinion of the chair, would the passage of this amendment increase the scope of the change of the underlying proposal? Uh, the chair previously stated their opinion and is still the same opinion that because this would not always be in effect, but only sometimes in effect, it decreases the scope. Thank so you. The, re the reason I ask it now, it had to be done when the motion was actually pending, in my opinion. Thank you. Sure. Uh, speech in favor of this amendment. I, I, I feel that ruling of the chair. Uh, that's a ruling. There's a appeal of the, uh, it's been made and seconded to the ruling of the chair that this amendment uh, decreases the scope of the uh, constitutional <coughs> amendment that's uh, being considered for ratification. Um, so that's uh, debatable on the remaining time. Uh, so the chair's opinion is that, uh, yeah, so just very briefly, I think I've stated it, that uh, as currently being considered for ratification is the main motion. This would require 3SB to be used every year, and the amendment would make it at the discretion of the administering world con, and therefore it would only take place take place some of the time. Therefore, it's a subset of the effect. You know, it, 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 would, it would cause exactly the same effect, but a, a lesser amount of the time if there's ever a world con that doesn't wish to use it. So therefore, it decreases the scope. Uh, that's why I argue in favor of my ruling. There a speech against my ruling. All right. Uh, still Joshua from the um, While in general, decreasing the scope of the amendment um, is a lesser is not a greater change. Uh, doing so and putting it um, in the hands of an individual creates a choice. And that choice is something very significant and is a significant artifact that is important to guard against. Therefore, I believe this is a greater change. Yeah, yeah. Is there any speech uh, in favor of the chair's ruling? Are there any further speeches against the chair's ruling?
Yes. Still Cliff Dunn. I believe that putting this as a putting a precedent in place where a change like this, putting a change in place like, <laughs> I believe that a precedent where a change like this is considered a lesser change, and therefore would be able to be implemented at the second at a uh, follow up Worldcon is a very bad idea because it allows proposals to be fundamentally changed in their second year of consideration. And we really don't want to open that can of worms where a single Worldcon uh, business meeting could effectively overhaul an amendment, completely change the spirit of it, and pass it along and stick, it, stick the next Worldcon with that out of the blue. Uh, speech in favor of the chair's ruling. My name is Kate Secor. Look, I don't like this idea. I don't think it's a good idea. But I think that the precedent is that anything that makes something optional rather than mandatory is a lesser change because it decreases the scope of the change that we're making. We are now no longer forcing someone to do something. We are making it optional for you to do something. And that is, in fact, a smaller change to the Constitution. It may be a bad idea, but it is a lesser change. Speech against the chair's ruling. Uh, no, you weren't starting to recognize them. Uh, still, Andrew Adams, uh, while I recognize uh, Ms. Seacole's uh, point, I think that the other way of looking at this is that this is creating a power uh, for uh, a future World Con Committee, oh. and I believe it's therefore a greater change. <coughs> um, uh, it's been moved to call the question. Is there a second? second. Uh, well, we'll pause for the secretary. Those who still wish to speak to the appeal of the chair's ruling, please raise your hand. Thank you. All those in favor of calling the question on the appeal of the chair's ruling, hold your, raise your hand. Thank you. Those opposed? The ayes have it. The question is called on the appeal of the chair's ruling. Uh, <laughs> all of those uh, who wish to or favor the ruling of the chair, please raise your hand. Thank you. Those opposed? Uh, I think the nays have it. Is there any? Uh, does anybody want to count? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. We will do a serpent. We will do a serpentine on the. You have to have it right in front of your face. It is right in front of my face. Okay. <laughs> Mm. No. Yes. No, there were. I think there were. Sure. Uh, it, our rules provide that if 10% of the people want a division, we should have one. All those in favor of division, please raise your hand. Uh, I think that's ten, more than 10%. So we will do that. Uh, those who are in, uh, who support the. Can you restate the effect of our vote of yay or nay? It's a factor. Sure. Sure. The the effect of our vote, uh, if the chair's ruling is sustained. We then get to, oh, well, actually, the, the, there's no immediate effect, but then we will, after the chair's ruling is disposed of, the, the appeal to the chair's ruling is disposed of, we will then revert to the amendment. If the chair's ruling is sustained, we could pass the amendment and still ratify this. If the amendment is defeated, it makes no difference whatsoever. If the chair's ruling is overturned and we pass the amendment, then we cannot ratify uh, 3SV because it would be a greater the assembly would have ruled it to have been a greater change. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So we are now voting on the appeal of the chair's ruling that the amendment is a lesser change. Those who of the assembly wish to sustain the ruling of the chair, please stand. Uh, we'll count off starting with the head table. And although the chair doesn't usually vote in this case, one. <laughs> Three. Thirty-three. Thirty-four. Thirty-five. 
am very angry and I am confused. So if we, so if we were to vote to vote for Mr. Stanley's motion, yes. would we then vote on the amendment and then on the main oh, sorry, motion? Yeah, we, we vote on them in order. Okay. On Zach, but we. You, you don't debate. debate. I understand we don't debate, but yeah. I don't debate and, and uh, subsidiary motions are out of order. Yes, we can vote now. Okay. So. The uh, question is on calling the question on all pending motions. It requires two thirds in favor. All those in favor of so doing, please raise your hand. Thank you. All those opposed? There being more than two thirds in favor, the question is called on all pending questions. Next is a vote on the amendment to make it the action of 3SV optional based on the administering world con. Is it in? No, good. <laughs> the amendment requires a majority vote. All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. Thank you. All those opposed? Thank you. The nays have it. The amendment fails. Now, yes, that is adding the additional clause of making it optional based on the administering world con. So we now vote on the ratification of 3SV. Okay, those in favor of ratification, please raise your hand. Thank you. Those opposed? I believe the nays have it. Ratification is defeated. Mr. Chairman, I move that we recess for approximately 10 minutes. Thank you. Any objection? Carrying on, we are recessed for 10 minutes. And then the meeting will return to order, and I am resuming the chair. My, my, oh boy, my, my, I just see my computer's clock. I, I need new glasses. Real clock. <laughs> 1221, yes. Yeah, sorry about that. The next two items on the agenda are C5 and C6. C5 is a motion to suspend the provisions of E. Pluribus Hugo for one year. C6. C4 was three stage voting. C5 is a motion to suspend E Pluribus Hugo's provisions for one year. C6 is, a, is the E Pluribus or the EPH plus proposal. After having been um, had his ear bent about it during the break, the chair suggests swapping these two around and doing EPH plus first. Is there any objection to doing so? Here. It, is there any objection to doing so? I'm not thinking. All right. <laughs> given, that of given that members have apparently forgotten everything they've been told for the last two and a half days, the chair reminds members that when the chair says the phrase, it's a magic phrase, is there any objection? The way that you get to tell us that you have no objection is, I know it's really, really hard, is to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> I'll try it again. Is there any objection to swapping E5 and E6? The chair hears none, and those two are going to be taken in the opposite order. However, before we take those up, the chair suggests that it would be appropriate now to receive a report from this year's Hugo Award administrators in supplement of the various written reports that you receive and suggest, uh, is there any objection to recognizing the Hugo Award administrators for not to exceed 10 minutes? Hearing none, Mr. White and any other people you want to bring in on it. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, Nicholas White, uh, Hugo Administrator for this year. My deputy indicates very strongly. Sorry, my, my deputy Catherine Duval, to whom I'm very grateful, indicates very strongly her desire that uh, she does not want to join me over here. So uh, you've just got me, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. I've provided some rather detailed reports, possibly unprecedentedly so, and I apologise in the first place for burdening members with lots and lots of extra reading. I don't see people being too horrified by that. Um, I just want to. I also want to apologise for the short supply of um, of the the first two reports, the votes in the final ballot, and the nominating statistics, which in a perfect world would have been available last night, and it is it is my personal screw up that they were not available. So I apologise to members uh, for 
before that. Um, just to go through the reports very briefly, and I would be very pleased to take specific questions on any of these, but I just want to run through what I've given you. I've given you the traditional votes on the final ballot in the first report, showing the preference count at all stages for all places. For the nominations tally, report number two, I have provided the number of ballots cast for each of the finalists and the near finalists at nomination stage, and the final points tally on the round at which they stopped being considered. This is a little technical, bear with me for a moment. The reason I've set off the top seven in a different shade of the box is that they're the ones that survive through to the final count. The top six are the finalists, the seventh is the runner-up, the remaining nine are the ones that are eliminated on the previous nine rounds, and the Constitution requires that I supply you with the figures for the last ten rounds of the count. So that's the final count, where there are the six finalists and the runner-up, and the remaining ones. Um, that my interpretation of the Constitution is that that information is actually sufficient. However, given the fact that we're bringing in the new system, I've also provided report number three, which gives you the point tally at each of the last 10 rounds for each of the top 16 nominees. And I'm saying nominees very deliberately here, rather than finalists. The number at the top is the ordinal number of the round of counting. Um, in many cases there were multiple exclusions, in no case was that in the top 16 rounds. Those of you who are able to look at color, color copy of this document, you will find it online. Um, here it's fairly clear that the, uh, the, 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 the numbers that are read online are slightly grayer here. For each round, that indicates the two nominees, surviving nominees, with the lowest point total on each round, and as you will recall, I'm sure, from the operations of EBH, once those two nominees with the lowest point totals are determined, the one with the lower number of total ballots is excluded. So just to look at the very first column there, on the 10th last round for best novel, uh, Children of Earth and Sky at 49.78 points, Infomocracy at 47.52, they were the bottom two. Infomocracy, however, had 99 votes, Children of Earth and Sky had 91. Children of Earth and Sky was therefore excluded. This did not help Infomocracy, which survived only one more round. So that's what's in report number three. Report number four, last year's business meeting requested that we as Hugo administrators should analyze the impact of EPH on the final ballot. In fact, in my opinion, it would have been sufficient to give you that information in the form of report number two. That actually answers the question of what the, uh, what the final ballot would have looked like otherwise to a very large extent. However, in the interests of providing members with as much information to make a informed decision about it as possible, we have done not only that, we have gone a little bit further, we have also analysed what the ballots would have looked like under EPH plus, as well as under the old system, what I'm calling the old system. And you will find at the very end, uh, the, the penultimate page, we have looked at the effect of five and six. Uh, and I've listed in each case which would have been the next, the, the next finalist in real life that would have been excluded um, if, it had, if there had been only five finals rather than six. My conclusion is pretty clear, um, and it's been stated already by other observers. EPH made it relatively easier in 2017 for a nominee with a large number of bullet votes to get, on, to get on the ballot. It made it much more difficult for a slate to get more than one voter on, more than one candidate on the ballot. Um, I, again, as I say, this is provided in the interests of good decision making by the business meeting. Uh, the final report is a log of the decisions that we took, uh, myself and Catherine Duval, and in the early stages, Colette Fozard, who was originally my deputy and then became deputy chair of the convention as a whole, 
Um, I, I thought again under the circumstances where the transparency of the Hugos has been under some attack, some criticism, it would be useful for members to see the thinking process that happened behind some of the more controversial decisions. In particular, there were a couple of appeals of eligibility, which I'm afraid I responded to rather curtly when they were brought up to me during the, uh, during the awards process. Um, I felt that uh, in the interest of clarity, those decisions should be explained in a little bit more detail on this occasion. Um, I do not necessarily recommend that future administrators should go into this level of detail. I feel that this year we were under rather extraordinary circumstances um, and I felt that a somewhat more vigorous response was required. Uh, I don't know if I've used all of my 10 minutes, uh, Mr. Chairman. I would be very happy to take any questions if there are any. You have three and a half minutes. Okay, um, I'm very happy to respond to yield, are there, are, Does anyone wish to ask questions? And then, uh, oh, microphone and over here, please. Ask your question by way of the chair, please. Still, you paddle. Um, is this thing on? Yes, you're just not holding it. Is this better? A little bit. How's this? Better. Okay. Um, not a question, Mr. Chair, but I move to thank the administrator and his staff for going way above and beyond the call of duty. Without objection. Is there anyone else, anyone wishing to ask a question of the administrator? I can see none, and therefore I want to add my personal thanks for the immense amount of work you did for us. Uh, we're very grateful, and we're very lucky to have had someone so talented and energetic, including you and your staff. Thank you. I suppose we should also thank the management of the WISPAS division, even though I'm, I'm now flattering my own boss. <laughs> Finding somebody like that. All right. The uh, secretary is working on catching up, and while she is doing so, I'm letting everyone know to make it clear the next item is going to be the forest's item C.6, the ratification of EPH Plus. The, for those of you who are just called out five, the meeting a few minutes ago voted to swap five and six around. I see. Yeah, you changed them around. Okay, they should actually run. What about C61, sir? It, well, C61 adheres to C.6. When you get C6, you get everything that adheres to it. this meeting, 
it increases the scope of the underlying proposal and consequently will require one more year of ratification. I feel it really Is there a oh. second to the appeal? Second. All right. The sit down, then we have five minutes for the appeal, which comes out of the five minutes for the amendment. <laughs> Just so you know. The chair believes reading through this material and attempting to parse it relative to the underlying material that it complicates the motion further and moves it further away that increases the scope. It's not the number of words in the motion, it's just how much does it make a change. And uh, therefore, in that consequence, I actually think it's the only way we can even digest it is to have another year, it, it, and that is why I believe it's a greater change. Mr. Cronengold, to speak against the chair's ruling. Um, give me a second to pull up the, uh, rather than, rather than arguing from memory. Uh, 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 Whoever's written, uh, Ms. Secor speak against the ruling of the chair, that it, which would come that no. speeches against are saying that this is, does not increase the scope, and therefore, if passed, we could then ratify the amended proposal. Thank you. My name is Casey Cork. As far as I can tell, the effect of 6-1 is to make the use of EPH plus optional. I continue to make my argument that our prior precedent is that making things optional is a lesser change and not a greater change. Mr. Gallo, in favor of the chair's rule. Still, Mr. Gallo, um, in our recent history, i.e., a few minutes ago, <laughs> we decided that things that give greater power and flexibility that did not exist prior to a particular amendment, in fact, constitute greater changes. Uh, so I believe we should follow the precedent, and I believe the presiding officer, in fact, followed the exact precedent that this meeting said was the way things should be made, oh, about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> Against the chair's ruling, Mr. Uh, Mr. Cronengold is the make, original maker of the appeal gets priority. Um, the significant difference here is uh, still Joshua Cronengold. Thank you. Um, the significant difference here. Um, is that rather than the inflection point being um, a body that does not traditionally make such things done within the year, um, the uh, the 6-1 would allow this meeting to make uh, the change available a year in advance. This is something we do all the time. It's how a sunrise clause is built. Uh, all this does is give us a sunrise clause that stays on for a while, or rather stays on for one year, rather than um, a sunset clause or a traditional sunrise clause. And therefore, I believe it does not expand the scope. How much time remains in the day total? Only two minutes. Um, Dr. Lurie, okay. on the immediate motion. On the, uh, on the appeal, this is a motion. Is there a second to ending the debate on the appeal? Second. How many people still wish to debate just the appeal? Hands? You're seeing none as there any objection to ending the debate. Okay, on the appeal. Those in favor of sustaining the chair's ruling that this constitutes an increase in scope or greater change. Those supporting the chair's ruling, raise your hand. Hands down. Those opposed to the chair's ruling, raise your hand. Hands down. The affirmative has that the chair's ruling is sustained. If this amendment is passed, it, create, it is a greater change, an increase in scope, and would require an additional year of ratification. I need to reset, I need to check the debate time what we have now. Is there any objection to resetting the debate clock to five minutes on the amendment only? Yes. I do that. Okay. I, I will actually. I shouldn't really, but I'm gonna. I'm gonna recognize the motion to reset the debate clock. Is there a second? Second. A two-thirds vote, undebatable, to reset the debate clock to on the amendment to five minutes. Point of information. Uh, question. What's it? Call the question on. I'll restate it if it's simple enough. Inquiry. An inquiry. Yeah. Uh, is it five minutes per side or five minutes? Total? It's five minutes. Okay. okay. 
I will state that as a general question to all, unless otherwise noted specifically, debate time is always divided evil, evenly between the two sides. And therefore, set, resetting the debate clock to five minutes means two and a half minutes for and two and a half minutes against in this particular case and in any general case when you hear time limits. I hope that's clear and that nobody has to ask that question again. Thank you. On the question to, to reset the debate clock to five minutes on the amendment only, a two-thirds vote being necessary to do so, raise your hands if you're in favor of amendment of doing so. Hands down. Those opposed? There is less, the chair believes there is less than two-thirds in the affirmative. The debate clock is not reset and now if you will just hold your tongues for about ten seconds I will get what the correct times are. There are three minutes total debate time remaining. That's one and a half minutes for and one and a half minutes against. Mr. Wallace, the maker of the motion. Yes, Dave, Dave Wallace here. And as has already been summed up, the effect of this motion is to make EPH plus optional by, op by positive option of the business meeting. That is, we would use in any year in which EPH itself is in effect and not suspended, we would use basic EPH unless the previous year's business meeting had voted to use EPH plus instead. Basically, EPH plus is the extra strength version of EPH. It does have a stronger anti-slating effect, but it also has a stronger effect on the ranking of other nominees. So it's not necessarily automatic that we would always want to use it. Um, I personally would be okay with the, um, the, the fact that this is deemed a greater change and waiting another year, going ahead with basic EPH for, for next year and then ratifying this, you know, it, it, it going through the extra year of ratification. Um, but basically, um, it, it would, combined with the ability to suspend, it would give each business meeting through 2022 a choice between no EPH, basic EPH, or EPH plus and allow us to respond to whatever happens you know, with, with that option go, going forward, you know, one year at a time. And, uh, and further commentary is in the uh, commentary to the amendment in the uh, packet. Time for debate in favor of the amendment has expired. Dr. Lurie, their motion to call the question is not in order because um, the, member, the member will not, members give me a chance to even state the ruling before you start calling out points of order. Thank you. The, the motion is not in order because there has not been at least one speech against the motion. Uh, uh, Mr. Harris. I'm oh, Okay. The chair has ruled that under the standing rules that we cannot move to call the question until uh, at least one speech uh, for and one speech against is, uh, has happened. That is in our standing rules. But, Mr. Chairman, I'm Perry and Marie. Uh, uh, I was the member the will not. Okay, okay. Sorry. Is there a second to the appeal? There being no second, the appeal is not before us. The chair's ruling stands. Mr. Harris, speaking against the motion. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very briefly, I don't think it's a good idea or particularly helpful to start switching from year to year. I don't agree that actually the previous year's business meeting is in a position to decide what slates may or may not happen um, and whether therefore we want to choose EPH or EPH plus. I think that only becomes clear usually in January and February when people start um, announcing intent. Um, I think either we will want to adopt EPA plus on an ongoing basis or we won't and therefore I think this amendment is not useful. The chair notes that the motion for the previous question to close debate is not in order when there is less than one minute of debate time remaining, of which there is. <laughs> is, there, is there any objection to ending the debate, however? Hearing none, we'll vote on the amendment, C61, to which the chair has ruled would constitute an increase in scope. Those in favor of the amendment to ratification only, C61, raise your hands. Hands down. Those opposed? Hands down, the negative has it, the amendment is not agreed to. We are now back to C.6, having used up. Uh, well, yeah, but I mean, we, we, yeah, but the whole debate time came out of it. The chair, that, that's taken uh, five minutes out of the total debate time. There's 
Well, four? Okay, thank you. There's 16 minutes debate time. We have not touched the underlying proposal. 16 minutes divided evenly, eight and eight. Uh, who is a proponent of EPH who wants to speak as the lead proponent? Anybody? Uh, I don't see any lead, lead proponent uh, among the... Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Wallace, you are among the original sponsors, so you, you get your side's one free, free uh, yeah, yeah. crack at it. Speech in favor. Okay, uh, so uh, as noted uh, previously, basically EPH Plus is the extra strength version of EPH. And um, it, it, it does have a, a stronger anti-slating effect. If somebody comes up with a big slate and tries to take over the category, the studies have shown that it probably gets about one more non-slate nominee uh, per category on average. Um, than EPH by itself would do. Given that we have defeated uh, three-stage voting, which I was hoping would pass, um, I think we probably should pass EPH plus at this meeting if, if the choice is between doing that and then, or having to wait two years to make any further changes. Because, again, I do not trust the uh, chief puppy to uh, simply abandon things at this point. He had at least 100 and 14 or so people voting for him who are members of this uh, con and therefore will be eligible to nominate for next year. I don't think we've seen the end of it unless he really gets bored and goes away and I think we need stronger defenses in place uh, just in case we come under attack again. We've sat through two years of what the effect of a strong puppy attack would be. I don't want to go through that again. Thank you. Speech against. Wow, so many people. Wow, who do I get to choose? Uh, Mr. McCarty. My name is Dave McCarty. Um, I am against the adopting of EPH Plus for this reason. Um, the, one of the factual statements that's been made about EPH that is in fact not true is that it does not reward bullet voting, but as we've seen, it does. Um, people who nominate only one thing have their votes count disproportionate to everybody else, and in fact, that's exactly how Box Day got on the ballot. He got people to nominate only him. Under EPH+, Plus, if you look at the analysis, you'll see that that effect is even worse. It becomes trivial to get things on to, to get singleton uh, horrible entries onto even our most populous categories. Uh, it takes, it, it would take the threshold to crack our, to crack our most nominated uh, categories like novel and best dramatic presentation down to about 3% of the nominating population. So I believe that EPH is in fact worse for the behaviors that we're currently seeing and not really, be not substantially better for the behaviors that we used to see. So I do not believe that we should adopt it. Yeah. Uh, in favor, and only one person rose. Mr. Cronengold. I move that oh, I, here, here. Sorry. Uh, still Joshua Cronengold. Um, I would like to move that we add a one year sunrise um, to the bill would not take, uh, be, uh, even begin to take effect until uh, the 2019. Now, remember, remember uh, all amendments are antithetical to this. Uh, they have to be made as speeches against a motion. Okay. And is there anyone else who wishes to speak in favor of EPH Plus? Uh, okay. Uh, anyone wants to speak against? Ms. Hayes. Ms. Hayes. I am fundamentally against EPH, and EPH plus is another reason I'm against it. Every time you're going to tinker and tinker and tinker with the process that most of us, or a large percentage I found, don't really understand and follow. It's a magic box. I would much have preferred three-stage voting, which was at least more open. Perhaps this body can come up with an, a transparent system that all members can understand to, to achieve what we want instead of turning it over to the magic box. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Starting to wander away from the topic at hand. Is who, uh, speech in favor of EPH plus? Uh, speech against? Uh, Mr. Balloon. Thank you. 
you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Kent Bloom. I would like to follow on to what Mr. McCarty was saying. Um, I think that we are, by using EPH, the effect has been clear that we are discouraging people from making nominations if they have more than one thing to nominate. Uh, because EPH and EPH plus more strongly uh, create slates when they aren't really slates. They aren't previously externally organized. They are simply people who happen to agree with each other in their taste for literature or, or, or dramatic presentations. And therefore, I think we should defeat this. Speech in favor. Is this a speech in favor? Is a request to call question? Uh, motion, to, motion to end the debate on this. Is there a second? Second. second. Yeah. Be before I put that, is there anybody else who still wishes to speak either for or against this motion? Thank you. Hands down. Those in favor of calling the question, ending the debate on the ratification of EPH, raise your hands. And EPH plus, sorry, item C6. Hands down. Those opposed to ending the debate? Hands down. There being two-thirds in the affirmative, the question is called, and now the question before us is the ratification of EPH plus item C6. If adopted by a majority vote here, it takes effect immediately with the next Worldcon being the first one to actually use it. All those in favor of ratifying EPH plus, raise your hands. Hands down. Those opposed, raise your hand. Hands down. The, neg the negative has it. The ratification is not agreed to. Do we need a recess here? No. Okay. I've been told I do not need to do a, a recess here. And I, there's a couple of things we might be able to do quickly. Yeah. C. Dot, well, well, actually, we're going to read. Yeah, sorry. Now it's C5. The motion to suspend E. Pluribus Hugo for one year. Uh, uh, we did not set a debate. Uh, we did. Oh, we just forgot to put it in here. Sorry. That's right. The debate time limit is 10 minutes. I uh, believe it was Mr. Yallo who made the motion. So we have 10 minutes total debate time on whether to suspend EPH for one year. Mr. Yallo in favor of a one year suspension. Still Ben Yallo. We now have real world numbers on what EPH actually does. EPH says that we, that we as a collective body think that Vox Day makes a better Unicomony candidate for best editor long than Patrick Nielsen Haight. I'm not quite sure that that's what people really intended to do. In fact, I think it's almost directly antithetical. What it says is bullet voting works. You should go out and bullet vote. I think bullet voting is a bad idea because I guess partially it's my own personal preference. I don't bullet vote. I vote for everything that I think is good. Or until I run out of slots. <laughs> Furthermore, EPH makes, vote, makes the nomination process hard to explain. I can explain in a few seconds how to nominate in a non-EPH environment. Nominate all the things that you think are good, and no matter what happens, nominating more things that you think are good will not hurt your chances of your things showing up on the ballot. Well, under EPH, that's not true. There are circumstances where if you bullet vote A, A will end up on the ballot. But if you think both A and B are good and vote for both of them, neither ends up on the ballot. That's, again, a really lousy idea and hard to sell to the public as this is a fair way of working. Therefore, I propose that we get rid of EPH and see what happens, because there have been sociological changes. We saw that, in fact, the SADs, unlike the rabbits, the SADs, who are, for the most part, members of fandom of long standing, well, they, dis they immediately decided to change from a slate of five nominees for five slots to taking a much larger poll. That's good behavior and it should be rewarded and not punished with something like EPH. Speech against suspension, Mr. Dunn.
Mr. Chairman, I'm still with Dunn. I am very concerned about two things. First and foremost, those sociological changes were a direct response to EPH. It is very pl plausible, I would say likely, that the SADs would have thrown another slate up if EPH had not been in place and we would have been back where we are. Second, by suspending this, we go back and we open ourselves right back up to slating. You know, the whole thing that we spent the last two years trying to defeat. Finally, I am very concerned, as I was before, that we're going to suspend this. We might or might not get a motion at the next year's business meeting to um, kill EPH off permanently, and who knows, we might be switching voting methods every year for the next three or four years at this rate. I don't think that, we, that the uh, motion to suspend EPH was put on the agenda for the sake of taking up debate time or because we felt it would be necessary. It was more of an emergency break to ensure that we would at least have it come up so that if strange, things interacted strangely, EPH had a weird interaction with 3SD if that had passed, for example, that we could take action because we were marking out new rounds. So I believe we should not suspend EPH. We should not keep changing our voting method. We should stick with EPH because it works. Thank you. Here, here. Speech here. in favor? Ms. Hayes. In favor of suspending. Lisa Hayes, I want to reiterate what Ben Yallop has said. It had some flaws. We saw those flaws. We put this in so that we could say no. We already put in one positive break, which is five and six, which has helped. And if we need more, we have other options. And I want to take those. I do not want BPH. Speech opposed to, ah, uh, I can't see you. The pillar's partially blocking you back in the back corner there. No, that's fine. Hi, Karina Stark. Um, I am in favor of keeping EPH and not suspending it for one year because while it is true that bullet voting does right occasionally get well, while it is true that bullet voting does occasionally get a single, we'll call it bad candidate onto a list, that is also the purpose of five and six, is so that we can just ignore whichever candidate we feel is um, unsuitable and we will still have five good candidates to choose from for that list. Here, here. Yeah. Come back over here and show your membership badge to the secretary. Uh, Mr. Bloom in favor of suspending this for one year. Mr. Chairman, I'm Ken Bloom and uh, it is my opinion that EPH had no effect on the puppies that the thing that had the effect on the puppies was the fact that they came in under no award repeatedly. And that that is the sociological pressure that caused them to change the way they behave. I think EPH has simply made things more complex and, and, and in fact has side effects that are undesirable. Speech against um, Alex. So do I actually. I like that phone. Oh, my voice is yeah. terrible right now. <laughs> Alright, I'm Alex Axe. Um, so basically, what made the puppies, particularly the rabbits, change their behavior was that they could no longer game the system with slates. So as Karina said, you know, yeah, they can get one on with bullet voting, but at least we have five other good candidates. If you get rid of the EPH, they are watching, and they are going to bring the slates back, and then we get to have another year where everything sucks. So, if only the business meeting had had a proposal that could have rendered EPH unnecessary that we voted down. Um, not that I'm being sarcastic or anything, but given that we don't have any better options at this point, I would strongly suggest that we keep EPH on until we get something that is better, because otherwise we are inviting a return to the, the Hugo shit posting we had before. Thank you. Here, here, here. Yeah. In favor of suspension? Well, Mr. Kowalczyk, and come on around here. <coughs> Two, about two minutes debate time remaining uh, in favor of the suspension. Kind of what Ben said, or Rick Walchick still, 
uh, kind of what Ben Yellow said, better we have a clear system uh, that uh, might have some problems to the short term until we can get something that's uh, defendable. EPH is a horrible system and it should go away. A speech against suspension. Oh my goodness, I've got so many people. Some of you are not going to get a chance, but I'm going to call on you and I can't see your name. You come back up here when you're done and show the second. Yeah, thanks. I'm Oskar Randala. Uh, bullet boarding works, but that's the price we have to pay, pay for having a system that is resistant against slates. We have six finalists. We have five Hugo worthy finalists uh, in the best editor category as well. So EPH is a good thing, I feel, and it was stated by a previous speaker that if you nominate both A and B, they are both likely to not make it onto the ballot, but, but I think that is not the case, actually, if you look at how EPH really works. Here, here. Okay. Here, here. Uh, that was in, against the speech in favor. How much time do we have left? Against or for you? Minute 40. Okay. Uh, Mr. Comrades. John Pomerantz. I speak here as a reluctant voter against uh, suspension because I am not a fan of EPH. Uh, I mean, we are for. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought we passed over that for lack of votes. Was that last person for the suspension? That yeah. last guy spoke? No, last was against. Yeah, last was against. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood. I thought the chair asked for favor and No, and I just I stopped. I was, I, I, then I then was trying to get debate time. Was there anybody who wanted to speak for? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, he's, he's right. I just didn't think there were any fours left. Speaking, uh, no, he was speaking against suspension. He said he was against suspension. Against suspension. Against suspension. Against suspension. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't matter. He's against suspension. Yeah. Against Mr. Suspension. McCarty is speaking in favor of suspension. <laughs> I remain Dave McCarty. I am not optimistic that we will suspend, but I wish to state this one thing so that it's on our continuing record. While we use EPH, we didn't have much of it this year, but we will continue to have perverse results with things getting knocked off the ballot for unknowable reasons that cannot be justified without looking at the raw data. That is an unavoidable side effect of EPH, and I think that that is damaging to our process. Okay, uh, Mr. Pomerantz is speaking against suspension. We have about two minutes remaining. Yes. As I started to say, I, I stand here somewhat reluctantly speaking against suspension. I acknowledge the problems of EPH. Indeed, I spoke fairly strongly against its passage on its first passage. Uh, I do think that societal pressures are sufficient to address slate voting and some of the uh, horrible results we saw with the initial rounds of the puppies. That said, and acknowledging the problems of bullet voting that others have spoken to eloquently, I think that our greatest harm would be to consistently swing back and forth with our voting processes. I will, at some point in the future, seek to have EPH pulled out of the Constitution, but at this time I think we should let it run for a number of years and um, uh, continue to get further data on what the results are. I don't think the ill effects are so significantly bad that I would support suspending it for one year at this time. So I urge you to vote to uh, oppose this. Here, 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 here. The chair is, let me finish. The chair thinks that we are starting to replow the same ground. Is there any objection to ending the debate at this time? Yes. Okay. Is there a motion to call a question? I hear that there's multiple ones. Who still wishes to speak to this? Thank you. And those in favor of calling the question and ending the debate on the question of suspension, raise your hands. Hands down. Those opposed to ending the debate, hands down. There being more, there being two thirds of the affirmative, the question is called. The debate is ended. The question before us is to suspend the effect of e pluribus Hugo for one year. A majority being necessary to suspend EPH for one year. All those in favor of suspending EPH for one year, raise your hands. Hands down. Those opposed? Hands down. The negative has it. The EPH, the motion fails. The EPH continues in effect for the following year. Can we 
What's the time now? So, is there any? Okay, we have to be out of here by 13:45. I suggest we recess for 10 minutes and try and get some of these smaller ones out of the way. This meeting is in recess until 13:15. The meeting will return to order. All right. After all that heavy stuff, we have a few light items, I think. I hope. <laughs> Item C.7 is called Defining North America, which adds a technical definition to what we mean when we say North America uh, by adding a new subsection, 4.x, for the purposes of this Constitution. North America is defined as Canada, the United States of America, including Hawaii, Alaska, and the District of Columbia, Mexico, Central America, the islands of the Caribbean, Saint Pierre de Miquelon, Bermuda, and the Bahamas. Mr. Chairman? Uh, before, I, before I proceed, the Chair notes that the list of including is, is a non-exclusive list and it just is giving examples. Uh, okay. Probably uh, my Mr. McCarty will come to the microphone and state that there is four minutes on this of which the inquiry is going to use up some of the time. Um, I remain Dave McCarty. Um, I, I was under the impression that when we punted the the sunset, the, the turning off of five and six, that we punted that to be next to uh, the EVH uh, turn off because those are related things. Uh, the chair does not remember us rescheduling it in that way. Okay, maybe I'm incorrect. I don't remember us scheduling explicitly scheduling five and six to follow EVH immediately. No. Is is it in order to suggest that we do it that way since we're on the topic? Uh, the, it would be in order to move to suspend the rules and bring bring item C12 C12 up in front of up in front of the meeting now, just so that we can dispose of the light business. Um, it is in order to make the motion. Is the member making the motion I to suspend so the, the rules and bring item C.12 before the meeting? Second. Is there a second? This is a non-debatable motion. What is the member's, the member will come up here and state the parliamentary inquiry and note that if the member starts to debate the question, I'm going to stomp on it. <laughs> um, while suspending the rules and reordering is a uh, parliament, is a um, uh, suspend the bomb, is a two thirds. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but is not laying the items in front of it on the table definitely until after uh, five and six? Uh, the member, again, first of all, the member is actually starting, maybe starting to debate it, but the motion to lay on the table also require, which is to set something aside temporarily without a set time to pick it up? Definitely. No, you cannot no, lay something on, you cannot lay something on the table definitely. You can postpone an item to a definite time. Um, sorry. Would not the motion to suspend the stuff in between definitely um, until after five and six uh, be a requirement simply require a simple majority? Okay, yes, that, that, that is you. the question. Uh, the motion, which is not in order at the moment, the, the motion to would there, that would be a motion to definitely postpone all of the things intervening between where we are now and item and five and six. It, I, I, I cannot take, I cannot, there is no motion to recognize the motion to spend the rules in front of us and requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor of suspending the rules and bringing five and six, item C.12, before us immediately, raise your hands. <coughs> hands down. Those opposed, hands down. There being two-thirds in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the motion to suspend five and six for one year is before the meeting. So much for light stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I have to go through the pages, folks. What, what's the C dot what? 12. 12. 12. Page 23. Page 23, which is item C dot 12 on page 23 of your agenda. The motion, there is no such motion as to say it. If a member wishing to lay that motion on the table to, to pick it up at some un, uh, at some un, yes. in, indefinite time in the future of this meeting. Yes, I'm motioning to lay it on the table. Lay it on the table, yes, okay. I need to make this absolutely, a second, I need to make it absolutely clear for the benefit of everyone here because the wording has a different meaning in British than it does in American. 
under parliamentary procedure, to lay a motion on the table is to set it aside without a set time to pick it up before we are done. If we adjourn without picking it up, if we adjourn for the Worldcon completely, sunny day, and we do not pick it back up again, it dies. At any other time between now and then, should this motion pass, it would be a motion to take from the table the item that we had set aside. The motion to lay on the table is not debatable and requires a two-thirds vote. Public to inquire. Mr. Yellow. And I will admit that in this case I am not rising with a parliamentary question. Oh, sorry, still Ben Yellow. I am not, as I have been known to do, rising uh, with a question where I know the answer. But, here I, <laughs> but in fact, here I really don't know the answer. I know that we are not allowed to return Sane D when there is privileged business still on the agenda. Would the chair let us know whether the repeal for five and six, since that is suspension. all the suspension of five and six, which we have in the Constitution, is sufficiently privileged so as to prevent us from doing such adjournment until we deal with that item? The, ch the chair rules that because the item came up, because the item came up before us, it's actually it was actually pending. It is before us. That's sufficient to have gotten it before the meeting. When you put it on the table, you did get it before the meeting. You didn't finish it, but you don't have to finish it. You just have to start it. And therefore, it would be in order. You could adjourn CDDA with that item laying on the table. That's the chair's ruling. Yeah. Parliamentary inquiry. Go ahead and state. The member will state his parliamentary inquiry. <clears throat> what, what, level, what level of uh, vote will be required to pick it up off the table? A majority. It takes two thirds to put to put it aside. But it takes a majority to pick it back up. That's debate. This is an undebatable motion. A two thirds vote being necessary to lay the suspension of five and six on the table. All those in favor of laying five and six on the table, raise your hands. Hands down. Those opposed. Hands down. There are way less than two thirds in the affirmative. The motion is not laid on the table. Five and six is before the meeting. Once again. This is the suspension of five and six. Yes. Uh, what did we, we picked a time for this, didn't we? I thought we did. Yes. Uh, Ten, minutes. Minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Of which we used a minute. We've used, we've used a minute. There are nine minutes total. Uh, there's nine minutes, which is four and a half each way. And fa uh, who did we? Who, was, who made the motion to to uh, suspend uh, five and six? Question. Who? No. Before I recognize the question, who made the motion to suspend? to suspend five and six for a year. Terry, yeah. Is she here? She had another. Oh, okay, that's fine. Then I don't get the reference. The member will come to the podium and state his question, which is going to use up more debate time. <laughs> Winton Matthews, since we're talking about nominations, where in the Constitution does it say how many nominations you can make? I can not the, member, the member's question is, is I mean, I, I don't, I, it's out of order. I'm not, I, I'm, unless you're trying to debate the motion, the chair doesn't want to answer the question right now. So I'm not, I'm not going to run that level. It's in there somewhere. I forget. It's, it's, five, it's five equally weighted nominations. Go find the wording in the Constitution yourself. <laughs> All right. On the, the, I'm looking for a speech in favor of suspending five and six for a year. Are, are you trying? Okay. Is there anybody who wishes to speak in favor of suspending it? Yes. Mr. Bloom, in favor of suspending five and six for one year. Mr. Chairman, the, I'm Ken Bloom, and I'm in favor of suspending five and six because we just agreed not to suspend EPH, and they work at count cross purposes to each other. A significant fraction of the, uh, of the EPH uh, act Actions that move slate nominees off the ballot are reversed by five and six because they, they move the they move them from four to five to six and then because they there's now six you know they they, they come right back 
So I think that this is working at cross purposes to EPH, and we should suspend at least one of them to find out how bad that is. Uh, it, against suspending five and six, and I've, I've, made, I've made you wait long enough, Mr. Cronengold. <laughs> While I've heard numerous complaints uh, about having six entries and being a very long amount to read, which is in fact what I argued several years ago, um, the having, uh, I urge that this year we do not suspend five and six because switching back and forth has been mentioned in this meeting several times. It's harmful to the awards. We should see how it runs for a little bit and then we can decide if we want to get rid of it and we don't want to have a six thing anymore. Uh, Mr. McCarty. In favor of suspending five and six for one year. I remain Dave McCarty, and I remain. Uh, I, I don't believe that we'll suspend it this year, but I want to say this in a slightly different way than Kent did, so that it is on the record. We've tested five and six. Or we, we tested EPH on many sets of data. Uh, there are reports uh, on the internet from the things in Kansas City last year, and what Kent is alluding to is that. If you have a slate of five candidates, if that happens, the candidate that the candidates that EPH knocks out of the top five, five and six, almost 50% of the time puts back on the ballot. These two things don't work well together. At some point in the future, when the business meeting has the stomach to take it on, we should remove one of them. Thank you. Speech against suspending five and six. Um, Mr. David. Desjardins? Yes, that's correct. Stephen Desjardins, I'm one of the original makers of the motion of five and six. I think we should not suspend it first for the reasons of consistency that people have given. Second, because I think the change is beneficial for its own sake. First of all, it provides some resistance against slating. Sometimes it puts a uh, uh, he puts a slate nominee back on, but, but just as often or more often it puts a genuine nominee on the ballot to counter the slate. And also I think having a broader range of nominees on the planets on the ballot is good for its own sake. The field is getting broader, there's a broader range of genres and styles. It makes a better ballot. Third, I think if you look at what was added to the ballot this year, it was mostly very good works. It's adding to the luster of the ballot by adding these five works to the ballot. And fourth, my anecdotal experience talking to Hugo voters and fans is that this is a very popular change and we should be reluctant to mess with something that people like. Thank you. Here, here. In favor, uh, Ms. Hayes. So would you call the question? Is there a second? To yes. Second? Yes. How many people still wish to speak either for or against suspension? Show of hands. Hands down. Okay. All those in favor of ending the debate on the motion to suspend, raise your hands. Hands down. Those opposed? Hands down. There being two-thirds in the affirmative, the question is called, the debate is ended. The question before the meeting is, shall the five and six provisions be suspended for one year? A majority being necessary to pass this motion. All those in favor of suspending five and six for one year, raise your hands. Hands down. Those opposed? Hands down. The negative has it. This is not passed. Five and six remains in effect for one year. Hang on, let's try and get one more out of the way. That, which we're starting to get into there. C7 is defining North America, which gives a technical definition of the, uh, in the Constitution of what North America is defined as. Canada, the United States of America, including Alaska, Hawaii, and the District of Columbia, which was the chair has ruled to be a non-exclusive list. I, I, I haven't finished stating the motion yet. I'll try and do that. Let me do it in the order you want to do it, Mr. Dunn, for the purpose of this Constitution. North America is defined as Canada, the United States of America, including Hawaii, Alaska, and the District of Columbia, Mexico, Central America, the islands of the Caribbean, San Pierre de Bermuda, and the Bahamas. That's the motion before the meeting. The chair, <coughs> I didn't get it on the record, but it was asked me before the meeting is to rule on whether that is an inclusive or uh, an exclusive or an inclusive list. It is, an, it is a list that is open-ended. These are examples. Other things that might be part of the United States of America are part of it. The, 
Mr. Dunn? Okay, in other words, the other parts of the United States of America besides Hawaii, Alaska, and the District of Columbia are eligible. Okay, okay. Or does the member withdraw his appeal? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> you really didn't want that appeal to succeed, and I want you to know. <laughs> Proposed by the nitpicking and fly specking committee. Uh, is there any design? Is oh, someone's trying to get our attention? Yes. For what purpose does the member rise? Point of information. That's it. Okay. The member has an inquiry. Come up here with the microphone and state your inquiry. Talk like this. Yes. <laughs> Come up here, face the audience, and address your question. Take your name. Hi, Joni Brill Dasha. I admit I'm geographically challenged. Somebody Why? show her. So Why is Central America in with North America? That's not what they taught me. The member's question is actually debate on the underlying question. I know you don't think it is, but it is. That, that is act, I'm going to count that as 15 seconds of debate against the motion. 10 seconds of debate against the motion. Uh, who wishes to who wishes to speak in favor of the motion? Uh, hmm, 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 hmm. Mr. Yellow. Still Ben Yellow. I still Ben Yellow. You're right. Oh, that's yes. Still Ben Yellow. Being the somewhat careless person who had taken this section out of the motion, out of the Constitution several years ago, I wish to apologize to the body for the necessity of putting it back in. <laughs> but I really do think we need to put it back in. Speech against adding the section. Right okay, I got inquiries. Let me see now. Who, I got, okay, are, all, wait, wait, are all three of you standing up to make inquiries? No, I'm, I'm, I want to make one. All right, then I'm going to take the inquiries first from Mr. Kowalczyk. And then Mr. Matthews. Okay. okay. I'm sorry, I'm being tired and I'm being geographically challenged. I'd like the chair to rule whether or not Guam would count as part of North America. The, the answer? No, 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 don't answer the question that's asked the chair. The member, the member will be silent. The question is, would Guam be considered part of North America for legal purposes under, under this motion? Yes, is the answer to that question. Any territory or piece of the United States would be considered part of North America for the purposes of this administration, of, of, of our Constitution. Mr. Matthews. That includes American Samoa and some other bits of rock that are out there. Winton Matthew. Quiet, please. My query is the islands of the Caribbean makes it sound like these are the only the islands that are within the Caribbean Sea. What about the islands that are boarding the Gulf of Mexico, like Cuba? Are they considered to be islands in the Caribbean yes. Sea? The, uh, finish your question and yield the floor, and then I'll answer it. The member has finished his question. The answer to the member's question is, yes, those things are part of the Caribbean. Are there any other inquiries about the effect of this motion? You had your chance. <laughs> Mr. Cronengold, do you have a motion to make? Joshua Cronengold, I move to call the question. Ah, thank you. Is there a uh, second to that? Second. Anyone else wishing to debate this in any way? <laughs> All those in favor of ending the debate on C.7 defining North America, raise your hands. Hands down. Those opposed? Hands down. The question is called. All those in favor of ratifying C.7 defining North America, raise your hands. Hands down. Those opposed? Hands down. The affirmative has it. The motion is ratified and becomes part of the Constitution. Huh? Principle. Well, yeah, okay, yeah, I see. Yeah, Iceland, Iceland is not eligible to hold an aspect. There goes the chance. That's the only thing that does. Green, 
No, green doesn't have any. Green and green are not big. Green and green. Okay, let's try this here. Let me see. I'm not sure. We got about ten minutes left, and I'm not. Uh, we have C8 is retrospective improvements part one. I'm not sure we can get rid of this in ten minutes. Well, yeah, but you're going to use 15 minutes to do it. But let's try it, and we'll see what happens. We might have to adjourn in the middle of it because I'm going. I want to adjourn firm at 13:45. Okay. Uh, inquiry, Mr. Kowalczyk, which is one of the reasons I don't think that we'll actually get through it all, but we'll see. Would it be wishing to adjourn until tomorrow when everyone's fresh in order at this point? Sure. Does the member want to move to adjourn? Yes. Is that a second? second? This is a debatable motion to adjourn. Does anyone wish to debate? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but before I do so, is, it, are, is there someone who wants to speak in favor of it? <laughs> yes. Miss, yes. Yes. The motion to adjourn. It's a debatable motion to adjourn, yes. Because I didn't actually get this thing before the floor. So. Uh, we're all, I, I believe most of us were retired, some of us were very late last night. And um, I think uh, considering this, uh, when we're all fresh tomorrow and not having to stop in the middle would be the best course of action rather than trying to rush through it. Here, here. Mr. Cronengold. The, uh, the before I, remember, remember, you may not move to call the question unless both sides have had one chance, and there's more than one minute of debate time left. Mr. Cronenberg. We have very little left on the agenda. I think if we all work together, we can adjourn and not have to come back tomorrow. <laughs> please, please, unless somebody wants to debate this further, on the motion to adjourn, the majority being necessary, all those in favor of adjourning at this time, raise your hands. Hands down. Those opposed to adjourning at this time, hands down. The affirmative has it. We are adjourned. Now, before I yeah, before we actually adjourn, I'm sorry, I just realized I need to tell you these things. We will, in a moment, adjourn until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning in this room. We have this room tomorrow from 10 to 1500. Please don't make us use all five hours. <laughs> we will be in here until. This meeting is adjourned until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Take your trash with you.